Pessoal, boa noite a todos. Obrigado a todos pela, pela presença. Vou misturar um pouquinho o inglês e português aqui. Espero que não atrapalhe tanto a tradução simultânea. Uh, well, it gives me great pleasure to welcome Dr. Johannes Krause here, here at Folha de São Paulo. Uh, I had the privilege to uh, read his book and interview him about it. And it's really uh, uh, a revelation, I think. Uh, I, I was following his, his work and the research of other workers in the field for, for some time, but seeing uh, everything put together in a nice and, and uh, I would say, very didactic and fun way at the same time was, was really great. And it gives, I think, every one of us uh, a very different and, and fascinating picture uh, of human history. And it's, it's really a great pleasure to, to, have, to have you here. Eu vou começar um pouquinho com algumas perguntas. É, a gente não vai fazer uma coisa tão formal hoje, então não precisa ser por escrito. Vou tentar deixar a bola rolando um pouquinho para esquentar a, a conversa com umas, umas três perguntas. E a partir daí, quem quiser é, perguntar é só, é só erguer a mão, eu levo o microfone até vocês. E nós vamos conversando aí num tempo de mais ou menos uma hora e quinze, uma hora e meia. Tá bom? Então, então é isso. Well, First of all, uh, Dr. Krause, uh, it was a great, uh, at the same time as it was expected, but also a, I think a great surprise for me to, to see your, your, your collaborator of, of a long time, Dr. Pebble, uh, to, to receive the, the Nobel Prize in, in Physiology and Medicine this, this year. Uh, because usually, I know, we know that the Nobel Committee uh, awards its, its prize to, to very different Areas, but there's always some focus on on uh, the impact of research in in, in medicine and human health, uh, and uh, awarding uh, this prize to 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 him, and I, and I think it's a prize for everyone who works in the field. Uh, highlights the importance of I think of very basic knowledge about about human history and what it what it means to be human. So I was wondering if you if you were expecting this prize to to come to him. No, I think it was a very big surprise to all of us, uh, even to himself. I mean, he was actually, I think, bringing his daughter to kindergarten when he received the call, um, and uh, it was very unexpected. He was first, he first thought it's a joke, um, and that, yeah, no, I mean, seriously, he has a lot of friends, he's Swedish, he thought somebody's playing a trick on him, and then only when there was one person from the committee that he actually knew in the committee started talking to him, he was like, oh, that is really Sweden calling. So that was a big surprise to him. But as you said, it's, 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 it's wonderful for the field, it's wonderful for anthropology, um, for kind of the study of human evolution. It's basically a reward for all of us, and we feel very proud, very happy, um, and of course very excited about, about this uh, prize and this recognition of our field. On the one hand, anthropology, but also ancient DNA, archaeogenetics, paleogenetics. He founded the field, and that's really the kind of pinnacle, of course, of any kind of scientist. And um, that's, yeah, it's well deserved, first of all, I should also say. I mean, he received the prize himself, which is also unusual these days. Often it's like three, four people that receive a Nobel Prize, but now having one person um, only being awarded the Nobel Prize. But in this case, it's really deserved because, I mean, he started the field in the 1980s, and there's no one in that field that contributed as much and kind of pushed the field and always on the boundaries, always cutting edge. Until today, he is cutting edge with his lab like no one else. And that's really impressive. So it's really well deserved. Um, I think uh, reading your, your book, what, uh, some, something that really uh, stands out, and I, and I think it, that it's, it's something that uh, will call the attention of anyone who's, who's a lay person who, who is trying to educate himself reading the book is uh, how it changes the perception of uh, maybe the stability, I don't know if, if stability is the right word, or maybe uh, the solidity of, of what we used to think about as human races, right? And uh, when we think about Europe as a continent of, of, of Caucasian people, of white, quote unquote, white people. Uh, so, uh, how does uh, knowing ancient genomes changes that perspective and, and show that what we see as separate races today is, is 
maybe is an epiphenomenon, something that is really impermanent, actually. Yeah. I mean, first of all, already population genetics of modern-day people has shown to us that there is no such thing as racist, because it's a gradient, and any kind of border that you draw in the gradient is arbitrary. So, of course, there's genetic differences between people from different ends of the gradient, but you know, where to draw the border between Europeans and Asians? Genetically, it's just a distribution of people, and it's, it's a gradient that kind of stretches from Africa to uh, Western Asia, Europe, then Australia to the Americas, and so forth. So that's something that population genetics has already contributed. Like no other science, genetics has actually shown that there is no such thing as human races. That's the first thing. Now, doing ancient DNA gives us even an additional piece of information. On the one hand, we can actually see that mobility, people moving, was basically happening throughout human history. That there is no, there is no continuity in most places. It's not that the people that live in Europe today are the same people that lived there five thousand, ten thousand, twenty thousand years ago. But people came in and out all the time. Like the majority of the DNA of the people that live in Europe today is from Anatolia. Came there seven thousand years ago. That's a big surprise, right? If I tell that to people in Germany that they're mostly Anatolian in their DNA, they're very unhappy about it because we have a lot of Turkish people and they don't want to be Turkish, right? I have to explain to them that the people that live in Turkey today are not kind of looking like those people at all because they are actually, you know, people that came from you know Eastern Asia to some degree, you know, much later. So there was also a lot of things happening there, and that's what we see everywhere in the world. There's very few places where we have continuity. Um, so mobility is really the history of humanity, which is expected because the majority of our history, prehistory, we have been nomadic people. We were not like, you know, sedentary farmers. And then, of course, there were large migrations still happening even in historical times. So it's expected. And this is also, in a way, a wonderful thing because we see how people are related uh, uh, and, and, and how people have been moving all the time. And that's the other thing, if we just talk about relatedness that we can measure, that's what we do with geneticists, we measure relatedness, similarity, genetic similarity. Something that I often tell people, and that people have not in their minds so much, is the number of ancestors that people have over time. So we all know our parents, grandparents, grandparents, like two, four, eight. If you go further back in time, it's an exponential growth. So in 10 generations, 300 years, each of us has a thousand ancestors. That's already a lot. But in 20 generations, which is like 500, 600 years, each of us has a million ancestors, mathematically. And over 900 years, we have a billion ancestors. They're all part of our kind of history. And people have even shown that in Europe, every European is related to every European over the last thousand years, blood related. Right? We're all a big family, but that stretches, of course, into Asia and into you know, North Africa and then Sub-Saharan Africa. So over 4,000 years, every person on the planet is related to every person. So if we then try to talk about races, it doesn't make any sense if we're all related to each other in very short time. You're not talking about hundreds of thousands of years, we're talking about 5,000 years, 4,000 years or so. So it really doesn't make much sense to have those categories. And it's anyway, you know, we, we would apply a concept that is from biology, which you know, race is, is a subspecies. I mean, this is it's, it's kind of really bizarre almost to kind of think that humans have something like that. And then also the way how people categorize that is often based on phenotype, like skin color, you know, dark-skinned people. We call white people black people, you know. But that doesn't make any sense because, you know, people in the Americas, in the Andes, in Australia, in the Philippines, in South Asia and in Africa on the equator are people with dark skin. Is that one group of people? You know, no population geneticists would put those people in the equator in one population and then the people that live in Northern America and in, in Northern Europe and in Northern Asia into one other category. So also it doesn't make much sense. Phenotype is a weird thing. And then what we can also measure with genetics is how the phenotype changed through time. So how did people look like in the past? And when we do that, we actually see that 8,000 years ago, people in Europe had black skin, right? They were not and blue eyes, right? Blue eyes, but dark skin. At the same skin. time. Um, very different to how the people look like today. And, you know, 
then again, it doesn't make much sense. If 8,000 years ago, people largely had dark skin to kind of, you know, talk about, you know, dark skinned race or something like that, right? So it's really, it's, it's a bizarre concept almost, but um, it makes sense in some places where you have people from very different parts of the gradient moving together. Like in the United States, you have people from West Africa, East Asia, and Europe, and Native Americans living in one place suddenly, and they are very different, and they recognize that, you know, phenotypically they look different, so they put up concepts of, you know, race or something like that. And that's also something I have to say when I talk about it in the book, when I talk about it now, I'm coming from a German perspective. And the German word for race is Rasse, and that is a different word, it's a biological term that we only use in the context of biology. Um, whereas race in English, in American English especially, is a, is a social anthropological concept. So if the Vice President of the United States calls herself black, black race, I, I don't want to forbid that. I don't want to say that it doesn't exist, right? I mean, that's a, as a social anthropological concept, it exists, but I'm just saying that biologically it doesn't exist. It's not a biological category, right? It's not a, it's not a discrete unit. It is, you know, something that you know, a lot of people feel themselves into this group, but they have to be aware that it's not a discrete unit. That's kind of what I'm trying to say with Races don't exist. So I'm often criticized for that, but then again, I'm coming from the German perspective. And when I talk about it in German, I even say race, the English word, when I mean what we talk about in North America, when we talk about the German word, then I say Rasse, which is the biological concept. Okay. okay. Uh, I, I see a lot of discussion, and some people uh, trying to uh, argue that, that, they're, that they're trying, some, some, the, the, uh, there are some scientists are trying to you know, to, to uh, stop uh, uh, scientific discourse about things like the relationship between ethnic groups and uh, genes that are linked to, to things like behavior or, or even intelligence. And there's the whole, uh, you know, ill-fated discussion about IQ, IQ in the U.S. and things like that. Uh, do you think there is uh, a, an ethical, thoughtful way of trying to study these kind of questions uh, without falling into the trap of, of racism? Is, is there a way to do that? Or is it better to wait for more knowledge to, 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 to be available and to, to understand better the relationship between genetics and complex characteristics before doing this kind of research? I mean, it's very clear there's intelligent people all over the world, right? There's not just intelligent people in Europe versus Africa or something like that. And uh, I think we need to understand better the correlation between genotype and phenotype. So that is something that, you know, genetics is, you know, largely also about. Genetics is not just about measuring relatedness, but it's also trying to understand what our blueprint, our genome, is actually coding for. So what are those genes for? You know, what do they do? So that's something that we're trying to understand because we want to prevent disease, we want to understand biology, we want to understand what humans are about, even what makes us human, right? The big question that Svante got the Nobel Prize for. So I think we should do that and we should not be afraid of doing that. Um, and there is a possibility, and it's something I think you know, David Reich was criticized for. He, he wrote this big uh, article in the New York Times in early, uh, I don't know what was, late, late 2018, where he said, we might in the future find a gene that gives, you know, that contributes to higher intelligence and that could be found in a higher frequency in certain populations in the world, right? It's not that that exists, right? But it could be. On the other hand, we do know, you know, a lot about genetic diversity in the world already, and we haven't found that yet. So I don't really expect it to happen. I think, you know, the genes that will contribute, and we already have genes that, you know, people have identified that do contribute, you know, they're found everywhere in the world. They're not just found in certain places. Um, and we might find slight frequency changes where there might be a bit higher here and a bit higher there, but then a good example is skin color. Skin color is something that we think we have understood. In Europe, you can do, you know, tests, you know, 23andMe, even like genetic testing companies offer that, they tell you what your skin color is based on your DNA, right? And that works well. So in Europe, if, you know, you have people mostly from European, but also sometimes from outside European um, ancestry, you can 
pretty much you know, predict what is the skin color of a person if you have the DNA of that person. However, if you apply the same test in South Africa, completely fails. It doesn't work at all. You predict it is, is totally wrong. You look at the actual skin color and what the genetics say, it's just wrong. Because the genetic diversity in Africa is much larger than outside Africa. So there's a lot of things we don't know yet because we just don't have it and most of the data is from Europe. So therefore, we, we might think to know things about how intelligence is related you know, to, to genes, but it might be very different if you, for example, starting to have more data from Africa, right? Uh, and, and, and it's really hard sometimes to kind of completely predict it. We have to basically do that type of studies where we correlate DNA with intelligence everywhere in the world, and it might be slightly different everywhere, right? The other thing that we have to keep in mind, and that's something that we can't emphasize more, is IQ, which is our you know, unit of intelligence. What is this even? IQ is what the intelligence test measures. But intelligence can be very, very different. Like what make, makes us intelligent if we know three-dimensional view, if we understand words, if we can do mathematical kind of equations, what is that useful for, for a person that lives in the Amazon? You know, or the person that lives in Papua New Guinea and Highland, right? It's not useful for them, but for them it's really important and it's intelligent for them if they know a lot of plants, a lot of animals, if they find their way, if they have a very good sense of orientation, if they, if they can interact in kind of social communities, social intelligence might be much more important for them, right? But then that's not what we measure. So if we do an intelligence test with people in the Amazon, they might fail completely, but that doesn't mean that they're stupid. It just means that they are, that's not the type of intelligence that they have. Even in our own population, if you do an intelligence test from 1950, you're like the smartest person on the planet, right? It's not that our genes changed in the last 60, 70 years. It's just, you know, our knowledge has increased. Our, you know, what, what we learn in school has, you know, tremendously increased. But it's not that, you know, our genes have changed. So it's always like you know, intelligence is something that you almost have to apply to a certain kind of population, certain place in the world, and then there you can also make that correlation to certain genes. It's, it's, a, it's a weird measure. So I guess you know it's, it's a long answer to a short question, but I would say we should be brave to do it. We should be ready to do it. I think we're ready to do it anyway because we're measuring many things. You know, intelligence is one, but also lots of health measures. Um, and uh, I think we're already doing it. Um, and I'm, I'm not afraid of it, I think, um, because I don't really expect that we find big differences, you know, where certain genes are, you know, distributed in certain places. And if anything, what we might find is there is more genes for intelligence in Africa, because Africa has much more genetic diversity than the rest of the world, by far, right? I mean, especially compared to, say, Native Americans or, like, some kind of uh, population that have been a bit more through a bottleneck. So expect... If anything, we find more in Africa than, than outside Africa. Pessoal, alguém já tem alguma pergunta que gostaria de fazer? Vocês vão deixar sozinho com a bola aqui para chutar pro gol, é isso? Pois não. Deixa eu ir até aí. Sim, o treinador fez um pouco de exercício. Pelo livro, deu para entender muito bem como. Pela análise do DNA, você sabe muito sobre é, aquele indivíduo. Eu tenho curiosidade de é, entender como que é o processo de conhecer como que era aquela vida em sociedade, como que é, aquelas pessoas se relacionavam, os hábitos é, do cotidiano é, daquelas pessoas. It's a very good question, um, and there's many aspects to it. Of course, we do not know how people related, like, like what was their daily life, how they interacted with each other. You know, we know that, you know, how people felt and how, you know, they had social interactions from, from history books, but we don't know that from the DNA. The DNA cannot tell it to us. Um, but we can, for example, reconstruct social structure. We can reconstruct families. We can reconstruct marriage patterns, polygamy, polyandry, monogamy, um, patrilocality, matrilocality. Um, 
we can reconstruct certain adaptations um, to the environment. We can learn something about kind of you know food habits, what people could eat, what they could not eat, if they could drink a lot of milk or could not drink a lot. I mean, that, that tells you something. It's little pieces, but they don't tell you too much about the daily life of people. But they at least give you some information that based just on archaeology and anthropology is hard to determine, right? I mean, currently we're really doing a lot of kinship analysis um, where we really look at how families were just constructed at, at the time, who had children with whom and in what way. Um, and that's something that archaeologists, for example, are really excited about to finally know, you know, say, I've been studying a lot of early farmers. In Europe, those people that introduced farming from Anatolia 7,000 years ago, they lived in big houses together, 40 people in one house. Archaeologists were always curious, if you live together with 40 people in the same house, how do you know whose father, mother, you know? Is that like nuclear families, or is it like everybody with everybody, you know? Is it like a, a wild commune? I mean, there's some populations here in the Amazon, like the Pinaha, for example, they don't even have a concept of parents, right? They have generation up and generation down. They don't have mother and father, right? So it could have been the same there, you know, some people suggested. Now we have the data. Very boring. Mother, father, child. Everything is a nuclear family. All the people nuclear families, right? There's no, there's no polyantry, there's no polygamy. They're all monogamous, right? I don't know how they did it with 40 people in the same house, right? I don't know. Maybe they slept outside, not inside the house. But, you know, they... And, and, and that's kind of information that we can contribute. But yeah, about the kind of daily life, I think it's, it's, it's a bit more difficult, obviously. But um, we can contribute something. It's, it's also, I was talking with Andre today a lot, you know, people criticize our work, our field a bit for, you know, that we can, we can answer everything now. Now we have the DNA, right? We can read in the DNA like a book. And of course not, right? But we can contribute to a lot of things. And it's like additional evidence, you know, that an archaeologist can use, an anthropologist can use. I think there's a certain danger, and that's something that I think I take as a critique on our field, that we tend to tell stories suddenly from the DNA. Um, but we have to be aware that, you know, it's just one line of evidence and you need a lot of things. And we should not, by just reading a Wikipedia article about, you know, whatever kind of pottery pop that, that existed, become experts in archaeology now, and then write a paper about, you know, we solved the big riddle of whatever kind of, like, some culture in the past. Um, and that's that's dangerous, but um, otherwise, I think yeah, we we have to take in all the evidence from different fields and then create a story. And it's in a way what also the book is about. The book is not just based on archaeogenetics. genetics. It, it takes information from many different fields and kind of condense it into a story. I think that's what we need. Let me be just a bit cheeky here and follow up on what what you just said. But uh, what I what I what I feel is that in Anyway, of course, of course, the, the input of archaeology and, and the dialogue between uh, archaeogenomics and archaeology is, is essential. But uh, don't you think you guys have, in some sense, reframed things? Because there, there's, a, I think, the field, there's, there, there was a strong sense uh, before in archaeology uh, where people uh, were very cautious or even averse to think about population movement and thought that there was only cultural diffu diffusion. And now you're, you're showing that there was actually a lot of population movements in different times. So in that sense, don't you think you guys are reframing the question? Yes. I mean, this is old debates, right? I mean, you have, yeah. like, in Germany we had... 19th century debate. Yeah, oh, 19th century, I think mostly 20th century, really. Uh, I think it might have started in the 19th century, but it, 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 it if, like, especially after World War II, say, again, I know it better from, from Central Europe than I might know the, the, the kind of debate in other parts, but there was this kind of essentialists and constructivists, and a lot of people basically said that, you know, everything that we had before was all a construct, and there is no such thing as, you know, certain populations, historical populations, and mobility was not a thing, migration wasn't a thing, but it was just cultural uh, kind of transmission and things like that. Um, but at the same time, there were still people that were more on the kind of side of people moved uh, a lot. And now comes the geneticist and says, yeah, people moved, right? So we indeed kind of ended that debate, right? That's good. It's like with the Neanderthals. You know, were they our ancestors or are they extinct? It's like, 
95 percent there are or ends uh, they are they're extinct but like they have contributed a bit like two three percent to us so like now we have data that's over that discussion we can kind of talk about something else um so i think that's where we can contribute the hypothesis that we can directly test and that's what we're doing um and i think it's good also because it op opens now you know kind of new questions, right? That we can ask more kind of specific things. And now that we know those things, we can quantify them. We can move on and do something else with the time that we have, right? Um, but people have to, you know, also then accept this and kind of don't just condemn it that this is not true. It's quantitative data. It's very little you can do about it, right? It's like you can't discuss it away. Like archaeology, you know, you have certain stone tools or pottery and you can say, oh, this is made by new people or this is made by the same people. It's hard to know. But we can directly test that. And I think this is also why it's so successful. That's why every week you read about a new discovery in market genetics or paleogenetics. Because, yeah, we can end some of those debates. But this will last for a few years, then they're done. And then we have to also think what's the next step in a way. And I think that's also what is important. That, that you know, now we have to think about what we can do. And that's, I think, coming more from the historian and the archaeologist than from us as the geneticist, kind of thinking about, you know, what next we can actually ask with that tool. It's like a tool. We have just, you know, sometimes I call it a tool, sometimes I call it a new library that we can read in, and just a very limited alphabet. It's just A, C, T, and G, so it's kind of the, the basis of the genome, and that we can now use to yeah, learn something about the past that we didn't have access to before. And it kind of increases our view and kind of how we understand the human past, and a few more puzzle pieces, but. It's never a complete picture anyway, but it contributes, right? That's all. Preguntas? Anything else? That's all. Can you fix it in time? Oh, fazer a pergunta em português? There you go. Retomando aquela questão central que você mencionou no começo, né? O que nos faz humanos? Tinha grande expectativa, né, quase mais de 10 anos atrás, quando saiu o primeiro draft do genoma Neandertal, que ele permitiria que a gente respondesse essa pergunta. E talvez até a expectativa um pouco ingênua de que haveria ali meia dúzia de genes muito especiais que explicariam né, esse lado simbólico, abstrato, e a fala. Logo depois né, teve aquele encanto pelo Fox P2, mas nos anos subsequentes se revelou muito mais difícil de encontrar esses genes né, especiais. Quase 12 anos depois da publicação do, do, do genoma Neandertal, né, uh, para você, qual que seriam assim, os, o, o, essa resposta? Né, o que, que nos faz humanos, então, geneticamente? Como que o DNA Neandertal, uh, o que, que ele nos ensinou sobre isso em específico? Yeah, so, 10 years ago, we had the first version of a Neandertal genome with, you know, very bad quality, so with a lot of gaps. So, the first complete genome we had in 2014, so like whatever, you know, eight years ago. So since then we had also then the genome of the Denisovan, like the Asian Neanderthal, so we have two genomes from the past. We can compare those two genomes to the genome of people today in the world and then see what do we have, what they don't. And surprisingly, that is just about 90 five amino acids in their proteins and their genes that we have and they don't. It's a very small number, 95. So there is 95, it's actually less 90 uh, proteins that are different between all modern humans and the archaic humans like Neanderthals and Denisovans. We have a catalog of that now, and in a way that's also what Swante got the Nobel Prize for, to produce that catalog. That's as close as we ever got to the question, what makes us human? It's those 96 amino acids plus about 30,000 positions in the genome, right, that are not proteins, that are not in genes, because only 2% of our genome are genes, 98% regulate the genome, right? So and sometimes we know what they do, and sometimes we don't. Now, of course, we have the information which genes are different. Now the next thing is to understand what they exactly do. And this is only starting. This is something that Svante Pebo, for example, is doing now. He's not doing ancient DNA anymore. He's not studying the genomes of Neanderthals. He actually works now for the last five years already, and he will probably do that for the rest of his career, 
takes those uh, genes and try to understand what they do. So how do you do that? You, for example, take human cells and change them in one of the places where Neanderthals are different. <coughs> and then see how is the phenotype different. A cell is something, you know, cell line, you know, you have it in a petri dish, it might not tell you much. But you can actually grow little organs, like a little heart or a little liver or a little brain in the petri dish. And then you have a little brain, and then you have a little Neanderthal brain, and then you have a little human brain, and then you can see what's the difference. Like, you know, is there phenotypic differences? And they, for example, found that, just published that in Science like three weeks ago, um, where they did things like that, where they then saw that the cell division, how the cells divide, in modern humans, there is a pause during the cell division, where something seems to happen, and in Neanderthals it goes much quicker. It's an interesting finding. What that means, we do not know yet, but it's an interesting finding that somehow human cells take more time to divide neurons specifically now. That's interesting. You know, intelligence is something that you would think is somehow different, and maybe that it has qualitative a difference. So we need to understand that further. And then kind of the, the goal of that really is to create a little mini brain or a little mini liver or a little, little mini heart or something like that that has all the 95 differences that is basically neanderthalized, that is in the kind of archaic human state, and then see what that does. I mean, the ultimate test would be, you know, to take that and not have it growing into a little brain, but growing it into a little Neanderthal. Try talking to it, right? <laughs> see if it replies, or kind of interact with it and see how it's different to us, right? That's the ultimate, you know, what you could do. That's not so straightforward. You know, theoretically, you could do it. Ethically, it's probably possible, at least in most countries. There might be some countries where you could do it. Um, but it's also a lot of work, um, a lot of additional work. But theoretically, it could be possible in the future to do that. And I think there was George Church, like famous scientist from 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 uh, Boston, from Harvard Medical School. He even um, asked around if there are females that would like to have a Neanderthal child, and he found three thousand that wanted to have a Neanderthal. What? Child. Yes. Yeah. They were really excited about it. It's like, you know, there are thousands of people that want to live on Mars, right? It's like stupid. Who wants to live on Mars? You die, right? But, like, you know, it's like there's a lot of crazy people out there. But, 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 but yeah, I, you know, eventually that's something that we could do. I think it would cost a lot of money, and it doesn't make a lot of sense, because if you logically think about it, even if we recreate the Neanderthals, they will only exist for 100 years, because they then disappear again, because they're humans. They have children with humans. There are 8 billion of us. There's maybe 10 of them. So in like three generations, nothing is left. 3% is left like we have today. So we only have them for a short time, and then they will disappear again. Maybe it's enough to then know how they're different. Um, but yeah, it's like step by step now. But I think we're getting closer. But it's, you know, I, I, you know, something we should probably not say, but like I think we have not yet found the gene, right? that makes us human, but we have found a catalog of them, and it might not be the gene, it might be an interaction, it might be a complex interaction, and it might take another 20 years to really figure it out, but I think now that we have these genomes, we have the catalog, we are you know, as close as we ever got to it, but I think we will go, go for a few steps further, and if that will be Svante Pebo's work, or it will be his legacy, and someone else will do it, we'll have to see, but I think we're very close now. But indeed, compared to the 10 years ago, the genome, you know, there were a few kind of examples of genes that are different, uh, but that was also low quality. I think that's very different to now, but there's quite a few people that now try to study those genes, especially now after the Nobel Prize, it's even more prominent. People know even more now that this catalog exists and you can actually study those genes. Preguntas? I'd like to know if there are science that couldn't agree with the results or this kind of story, and uh, what's the dangers of this kind of deniers? And what do they say? It's not mm. correct because mm. they can prove against your <laughs> theory. Yeah. Honestly, I'm not too much aware of, like, you know, deniers of that. I mean, of course, you have a lot of crazy people in the world, and you find every theory, you know, you can probably come up with a theory, either 
Earth is a square, and you know you have some people that don't believe in the concave, Earth. Concave Earth is the last famous one. Concave, okay, concave Earth, Earth. Okay, concave Earth, whatever. You know, you find everything. Um, but it's not really a big movement, unlike you know Corona deniers or something like that. Um, of course, there's a lot of people that don't believe in evolution. There's some people that feel very Christian and don't believe, you know, the Earth is six thousand years old and God created us and like those things. Of course, you know, that's just crit critique on evolution in general or like where humans come from or something like that. And that you know, you know we we have that for a long time. We will have that. And I think in the U.S., more than half of the population does not believe in human evolution, right? So. You know, what do you do, right? They all believe that your Earth is whatever six thousand years old or something like that, which is hard for scientists to you know like, you know do. But then we live in a post-factual world where people don't listen to facts and don't believe in science, and it's a scary world we live in. But um, we hope that this might change again in the future. You know, um, but yeah, I think the only thing we can do as scientists is try to communicate our science, try to under make it understandable. Don't hide, don't retract in our shell and kind of, you know, be in our ivory towers, how people sometimes say, but instead, you know, sit here and talk to you, <laughs> write a book about it. Um, that's something that, in a way, why I did this, you know, I mean, I'm a scientist, I don't need to write a book, I'm not a journalist, I'm not, a, you know, kind of like writer, but I felt, you know, when I'm talking to my mother, you know, she's interested in what I do, a lot of people are interested in what I do. Um, so why not writing it down then? I mean, I teamed up with a friend of mine, uh, Thomas, who's a journalist, to kind of write it in a language that is more understandable than my own language. Um, and I, I think that's, you know, that's what's the motivation to do that. But it's also to go out there, and like, you know, because human history, human evolution, racism, like all those things, you know, they're closely related. And I think, you know, putting some more information out to the people um, is, is, is a nice thing. And I think that's the best way that we can counter this 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 uh, kind of movement. On the other hand, you know, I think we're largely a lot of people are largely lost anyway. I think we will not connect them back. I saw that it probably had the same experience here in Brazil during the Corona pandemic. That the people against vaccination, people that are deniers, and they, like you have them in your own family, you have them as friends. There might be people in the room, and you know, uh, how do we get those people back? It's not it's not easy. You know, I saw it within the families, and it's really it's like at some point though, I felt like you know. You should just stop talking about this. It's a topic, you know, like, it's, kind of, it's like with religion, you know, and evolution, and you just don't talk about it anymore. It's maybe not the solution, but maybe it's a peace <laughs> kind of declaration for some time or so. Yeah. Um, thank you for speaking to us. And I had a question related to an earlier point on the conversation about race and like the English understanding of the word, and then in a more biological sense, how. Um, it will be a concept that it doesn't have like the same meaning, it completely changes. And on this idea of like viewing race from a biological perspective, I was wondering about what your take will be on research, um, such as like differential gene analysis that is stratified based on race to better understand like disease pathology and stuff like that. And if you think that will be like a fruitful endeavor or if you think it will be similar to like the question about intelligence, where like it's just gonna have a lot of difference. This is very important what you're saying there, and this is you know within medical genetics there is a large, you know, movement over the last couple of years to you know look at the genetic diversity and this kind of what you talked with intelligence before, but for disease you know genotype phenotype correlation and you know if you can gain information from knowing the you know ancestry from someone about kind of the risk for certain genes, like that's also what David Wright, for example, had in his article in 2018 about prostate cancer, something that he was doing research on 20 years ago or so, and he found, you know, in his research that people from Afro-American ancestry, they had a higher chance to have prostate cancer and have genes with prostate cancer. They give you a kind of higher risk for prostate cancer than, than people with, say, European ancestry. So when you have an Afro-American coming to, to the hospital in the U.S., might want to treat him differently because you know he has that type of ancestry. If you do an ancestry test, then maybe that is then the right thing to do, right? To kind of, you know, kind of measure how much ancestry someone has that kind of, you know, gives certain risks and kind of certain medication or, or things like that. I understand this. However, I 
feel that this is kind of maybe what we did like 10 years ago, but I think it's moving away from that now because first of all, we have much more genomic information now. I mean, we have now millions of genomes from millions of people. Ancestry is anyway very complex and a lot of people are genetically admixed, right? It's not a lot of people that have four grandparents from within 50 kilometers or something like that. But people are from all over the place now. Um, and we have something we call personalized medicine, right? Like why do I need, you know, just because someone has 60% Afro-American ancestry, uh, treat this person in a certain way, if, if I can actually sequence the genome of that person, and I know what genes the person has. I know that has that gene or it doesn't have that gene that I have identified before in a genome-wide association study or with polygenic risk scores or something so that I know exactly what, what that person has. So I don't need to anymore kind of look at you know, ancestry for that person. I think we're moving away from that. And I think the next step really will be just personalized medicine. I mean, the, the company is now like 23andMe. They do a genome-wide analysis for $50, right? It's crazy. You know, there's something like in, in Europe, we have Danta Labs. They do a whole 30x coverage, high-quality genome for $200. Right, that's crazy. That is like so cheap, right? Like if I if I go to the if I go to the to the doctor and I get like a you know blood measurements for all my kind of different blood blood values, varieties, the cost from the health insurance costs like three hundred euros, right? It's more expensive than a genome. So it's so cheap by now and gets Norton. There's a new sequencing technology coming. Gets even cheaper in the next two years. Um, I think that's where we're going to going to move personalized medicine. But the problem we then still have is that there are parts in the world where we have not yet understood the genome type phenotype correlation that well, like Africa. We have very little data where more work needs to be done. We need to understand those people better. But then, of course, we have Afro-Americans, for example, um, that, that have a lot of that genetic diversity from West Africa that they brought to the Americas, like they have here in Brazil as well. So there's a lot of places where we can study that, and then we learn that even better. Um, but if we really need to kind of, you know, correct it then also, because also polygenic risk score, which is kind of the new thing, new kid on the block in medical genetics now, um, needs to be done with a certain knowledge about the diversity or kind of like, you know, what population people come from. It needs to be corrected, basically, because you get the kind of information about what genes kind of are correlated to what medical condition from a reference data set. But that reference data set is in almost all cases currently European or North American, kind of white, if you want. We need to create that also for other parts of the world. And of course, people are aware of that, but it's just, you know, almost like historical artifact now that most of the genetic data is from, you know, Europe and, and North America. And it's not easy to change that because also other parts of the world are often more critical of it. Like, try to do that on Native Americans in the United States or First Nations people in Canada. They don't want to have any genetic work done on themselves, right? So we will not be able to provide them with polygenic risk scores because we will not get their genetic data because they don't want it. Same with Australian Aborigines or you know, probably also some populations here in South America, even though it's a bit more, more, more relaxed here uh, than in North America. So, so this, is a, this is also a problem. It's, it's kind of funny because those people don't want to participate because they're afraid of abuse. But then you know, they deny themselves access to kind of the next generation of medicine. Right, which is you know kind of a funny situation that we're moving into, but um, I think it's important still to kind of you know do do that you know because we need we need to move into this personalized medicine and not kind of just treat someone based on their ancestry. It's a very rough view of people. Yeah. Uh, I can look at uh, I was just wondering about transposable elements and if you have studies on that and prehistoric DNA and, you know, evolution? I mean, transposons are fascinating. Um, so transposons for the people that don't know what that is. So those are, you could call them genome viruses. So they are elements of our DNA that jump around. So they have, um, they often code for they used to be a virus maybe hundreds of millions of years ago, but now they're just an element of DNA that can replicate itself and insert itself somewhere else into the genome. And this is actually not a bad thing. Um, so an example of birds. Birds don't have a lot of transposons. Um, the bird genome is actually very stable because it doesn't have transposons. Because what transposons are also causing is they make the genome instable because they allow basically some, you know, 
that there is exchange between chromosomes or that there is basically connections between chromosomes. So genes can jump around because of transposons, because transposons are basically identical in different parts of the genome, so therefore during you know replication then suddenly you know things are basically combining with each other and then you basically have things moving around. Even whole chromosomes can fuse because of that. Birds don't have so much transposons, therefore birds are very stable, which is wonderful. If you ever want to create the dinosaur genome, which is, you know, birds are dinosaurs, you know, it's really good for us because alligators and chicken have very similar structure of their chromosomes still, even after 200 million of years, right? So actually, if you get the common ancestor of a bird and the alligator, it's a dinosaur, right? So then kind of like, you know, we can actually recreate that. <laughs> we don't need Jurassic Park. We can basically just do that on the modern genomes of those two. Um, so humans are monkeys, you know, primates, are great apes, and great apes and, and, and primates have a lot of transposons. And humans, modern you or say great apes actually, have actually even more than, than primates have, the kind of monkeys have. So we have even more transposons, we have especially things like alu elements, which are you know, one family, uh, and there's even some that are, you know, in, in, in modern humans even, or not modern humans, so the Neanderthals have them as well, the Denisovans have them as well, they have them more than like chimpanzees, for example, more active, you know, transposons than, uh, than great apes have. So some people think, but that's just a hypothesis, kind of hard to test, but that our evolution was so accelerated, if you compare, you know, say apes and humans, because we have even more activity of transposons than those apes have. And apes are already, compared to monkeys, more, uh, you know, accelerated than, than, you know, primates have been because we have more of those elements. So I think that can be a good thing. But fast evolution can be good, but it can also be bad, right? You don't want to have too much mutation, don't too much change. But for bringing up new phenotypes, say it's good, right? So I think in general it's a good thing. Your question, I think, was more targeted towards ancient DNA and like Neanderthals or something like that. Comes a problem, and the problem is that our DNA is very degraded. It's very short. So that means transposons, which are often pretty long, but identical in many parts of the genome. They have often very high copy numbers. There's like thousands of copies of a certain other element, maybe even millions of them. We don't know where they are in the genome from an ancient individual because they're, sh they're too long and with the short fragments we don't know. So that is also something that I have to disappoint people when you know I talk about you know we have the Neanderthal genome, <coughs> we have 80% of the Neanderthal genome, we are lacking 20%. Even the human genome was only finished like last year or something like that, and you know it was first announced in 2001. We have the human genome. And they said, oh, no, actually, it wasn't everything. 2003, they said, now we have it. It's like, yeah. 2008, they said, we have a little bit more. Now they said, now we finally have everything. It's because there are those long, repetitive regions that are really hard, even for modern DNA, to, to reconstruct. And with Neanderthals, because it's ancient DNA, we have even more problems. And there's 20% of the genome that are highly repetitive. AC, 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 a thousand times. We will never be able to reconstruct that, and often transposons are like that. So we don't really. So again, long story short, we can't really quantify if Neanderthals had more transposons than, say, modern humans have. But given they're so closely related, 99.9 percent .9 identical in the DNA that we have, we don't really expect them to be, you know, much different than we are. But we are different to. You know, great apes and great apes are different to you know new world monkeys or old world monkeys. Um, so we are already you know on a scale more you know we have more transposons, we have more mobile chromosomes than than, than uh, many other uh, species have. But I think we're not on the top. I think there's probably other species in biology. I don't know it enough about it that have even more transposable elements than than humans and and, and great apes have. So again, no. Mais perguntas? Ali, o Paz de. Boa noite. É, hoje em dia, a saúde está evoluindo a, a cada dia. Não só a saúde, mas é, as empresas que, que organizam dados, que. 
é, tanto no Brasil como fora do Brasil, mais ainda, é, que tem um perigo, assim, é, tem um certo perigo daqui, daqui no futuro breve, é, é, piratas pegar esses dados e, e vender. Principalmente se, se a pessoa for famosa, se for algum cantor famoso, algum político, algum grande artista. Né? Que, então, é, os, é, é a chamada bi, é, biopirataria. Desse mesmo modo, é, qual seria o perigo de, de um pirata pegar nossos, é, nossos dados sobre o nossos genes e vender para alguém interessado. Não sei se você entendeu a questão. So, um, not quite sure if I know what you mean with pirates, but I think that people stealing your DNA. I mean, there is this, always, of course, you know, I come from a country that takes data security extremely serious. Germany is very, very protective about data. We don't have anything digital. Everything's paperwork, right? You go to the, any office, everything's always paperwork because they don't want to have anything digital, which is horrible. Um, I notice here's a bit different. I went like to some places here in a restaurant where people ask for the social security number and then you kind of type it out. They know your name and where you're from. And like, whoa, that would never be possible in Germany. Um, but You know, genomic data, of course, is extremely personal data, right? It doesn't go much more than that because it's your, you know, blueprint. You know, theoretically, if you have the right tools, you could recreate the person. You know, if they have, you have that DNA. So if someone steals that, they could copy you. It's like, oh my God, <laughs> do I want to copy out myself? I'm not sure. Um, the, the the genes themselves, you know, you have in common with a lot of people. You know, I don't think that you carry anything that you know, is not found in anyone else here, you know, in the room probably even, right? And the combination of genes you have make you different to your neighbor. But it's not that you have a gene that no one else here has. We probably, you know, kind of more or less have very, very similar genes. Um, but the combination is somewhat different, right? I, I have, you know, I know my genes because I've done genome-wide analysis and, you know, I have, you know, a gene for lactase persistence, so I'm, I'm lactose tolerant. I can drink a liter of milk, no problem. I think half of you cannot, right? So that's, you know, something that makes us different. But that type of information, those are the genes that, is this understanding that I talked before about genotype, phenotype, how we correlate a gene with, you know, a property, you know, an ability, you know, a look or something like that, or a medical condition or so. But that's what we are creating in the field of medical genetics or kind of genetics in general, human genetics. We get this information. Um, the danger that I see, which I, you know, maybe divert your question a bit, is we are now having tools that allow us to change the genes, right? We have now tools like CRISPR-Cas where we are able, in a developing embryo, to actually change the gene from, you know, instead of A, make a T, instead of C, make a T in, in the gene. So we can switch genes, we can change them. So like, whatever, if I want my children to be lactose tolerant, um, but I might, I'm not, my, my wife is not, I could change that and kind of, you know, switch that gene. Which is something we, you know, it doesn't make a lot of sense for milk <laughs> consumption, right? You can also go to the supermarket, buy lactose-free milk or don't drink milk. Um, but there's of course other things where it might make sense, like breast cancer. Right? Say a lot of families have a risk gene for breast cancer. An example is Angelina Jolie. Right? She, she, her family has this risk gene. What did she do? She, she removed her breasts. Right? Which is you know part of her. You know she's an actress. You know she makes money with her body also. You know it's a big step to do. But she did that because she didn't want to die on breast cancer before 50, which she had an 80% chance that she would have died. You know, so therefore she decided that. And, you know, she has children, you know, if the technology is there, I mean, she's rich, she has a lot of money, you know, I could see that, you know, she might have an interest to use kind of latest technology and then have children that don't have that gene. And now we can, you know, we have the tools. They're not completely ready, they need to be, you know, made perfectionized, but, you know, we're getting there, right? We're like close to that. And as the medical field needs, you know, if they have tools to treat people, you know, 
they have to apply those tools. You know, you cannot, it's almost like we cannot not use those tools. We have to use that tools. If, we, if there's a family that has a horrible genetic defect, and we have a tool to, to fix this in their, in their offspring and their, their children, of course we have to do that. And we will do that. There's no question, for me at least, that CRISPR-Cas will be used in the next 10 years on humans. Right? It might take five years, might take ten years, maybe it takes twenty years. But in this century, certainly, we will start doing that in big scale to change genetic disease genes. You know, in, in, in like you know, developing humans, because there's a lot of people that have disease genes. All of us carry some. Some of them are, however, really bad because they're dominant. So that one copy is enough that they're bad. Most of us have some where you need two copies. That's why you shouldn't procreate. You shouldn't have children with yourself or with your siblings because then there's a high chance you get two bad copies of that uh, gene. Um, but we, even those genes that are what we call recessive, we will have the tools now to cut them out of our genome. I think we will start doing that. Um, but then, and that now I'm coming to your point, there is a risk that while we are fixing this breast cancer gene, we could also kind of change the gene for the eye color and maybe blue eyes are nicer and you know blonde hair is nice right maybe curly hair is nice right <laughs> maybe a combination of like light eyes and like you know blonde and curly and we you know we could do those things as well because we know those genes already right we know the gene for light eyes we know the gene for like blonde hair or like light skin you know some of them at least so th that is the risk and I think it's almost unavoidable that people will do that as well. I do expect that very much because it's kind of hard to stop people doing that as well, you know, you know because then people might argue, you know, in certain conditions it might be better to have a certain phenotype or something like that. Like we can't change, you know, the, you know, how people dress today and how people use makeup or, you know, kind of what type of surgeries they're doing, all that stuff, you know, and in a way we can't stop people then to also choose how they change the genes. So some, but sometimes people ask me about evolution. They say, what's the next step in human evolution? What happens in human evolution? Where do we evolve? How do we look like in a thousand years? Hard to predict. But I can tell you, it's not natural selection. It's not nature that will change us. It's ourselves. We take human evolution our own hand in the 21st century. We start to change our genome. How we will change it, we will see, but I think Mostly it's, it's good. It's a good tool. Like, talk to people that have a genetic disorder. I have that in my family where, you know, basically, you know, it's not my family, but my in-laws. You know, where, you know, that, that, that is a genetic risk gene that people have. And, you know, nobody wants to carry it, right? You know, people that do abortions when they get, get the wrong one. It's like, you don't really want to, you don't really want to be in such a, such a situation. If we can fix that, we will fix it. And, if we then in 200 years have more people with curly hair than straight hair, it's <laughs> like, you know, straight hair than curly hair, I, I don't care too much about it, right? It's not a big problem, but it's more healthy people. I think that's a good thing. Um, and I think we will mostly cure disease with that. And then again, if more people have a certain phenotype, you know, that's a problem. What we, of course, have to be aware of, I talked about Angelina Julie, I talked about, like, rich people. This would cost a certain amount of money. So the question is also... Who has access to that type of technology, right? I mean, for the first 20 years, probably not a lot of people on the planet. But then it, again, in 50 years, maybe it's standard. Like, you know, antibiotics, maybe they were hard to afford 100 years ago. Or they were not around 100 years ago, like 50 years ago. Um, but, you know, now they're standard and, you know, everywhere they're, they're given. And that you know, might be then the same for, for genetic kind of manipulation, if you want to call it like that. What about when... Uh, people would, would try to, to do this kind of thing with, with behavior when you have thousands of different genes, each with a very small percentage of, of influence on the trait. And you, is it, is it uh, theoretically possible that, that you would be able to know the exact contribution of every <laughs> single one of those thousands of genes? No. I think it's too complex because it's like, you know, it's a combinatorial problem. If you have a lot of, lot of, lot of genes, you know, that influence, you know, behavior, for example, I think it's really hard to then, you know, because it's always shuffled, right? And some people say, you know, like, 
God is rolling the dice, you know, every time. And in a way, that's what's happening, right? Recombination. It's not God. It's just nature. It's biology. It's recombination. It's a combination of genes, of like thousands of genes and how they interact with each other. Um, and the good example is siblings, right? I mean, you know, you might have siblings. You know, you might have children, right? More than one. They are very different. They're not always the same. They don't. They're kind of, you know, from the same parents. But even when they're twins, <laughs> even with twins, you know, you see different behavior, right? Even monozygotic twins are, have different behavior. So, you know, it's always the question: nature, nurture. But like nurture, it has a strong effect. You know, fifty percent of behavior certainly is like environment. You know, it's not genetics, and that is not nothing you will change with the DNA. But there is a genetic effect to it. Um, we will not understand every gene, but theoretically, it could even be possible if we have understood better what kind of genes influence behavior to a certain degree. That you know, while we're changing blue or brown eyes to blue eyes or blue eyes to brown eyes, that we could also make people you know change in their behavior a bit, right? Make them you know whatever we think is a good thing. I don't know. It's also what is good. You know, it's like with fashion. You know. Maybe it's good to be more intelligent. Maybe it's bad to be more intelligent, right? It's like it's also when you have people that are in the spectrum. You know, often people that have, say, you know, autism or something like that, they're extremely intelligent, right? But do you want, you know, everybody to be like that? You know, probably not, right? So it's probably sometimes better to be, you know, not having a too high IQ because you fit less into society than if you were just normal, right? So this is also something, you know, what, what do you want to achieve, right? I have a lot of academic friends, obviously, because I'm an academic, and, you know, they always want to have intelligent children. I'm always like, I don't want my child to be who are hyper-intelligent because then it's just like, it's maybe not so good for the child, right? It might be, you know, good for your proud or hyper-intelligent ch uh, children, but, you know, maybe I don't want it to be super intelligent, I just want it to fit into society and have a normal life and be a happy person, right? It's much more important for me, but that's my you know, personal wish. And then, you know, people have personal wishes that are different, so I don't know if that, you know, we really happen, that we have a catalog and then we say, okay, want well, this behavior, this phenotype, not this disease, and kind of like, can you kind of do all that? But I think that catalog and that technology will exist in 20 years or something like that. But, yeah, I think, again, fashion is different, so what people want, I think, will, will vary, will, won't be all the same. Bom, boa noite. É, assim, do ponto de vista religioso, assim, como que, ou qual o limite, né, da manipulação genética, assim, que a, as pesquisas científicas podem determinar que vão é, de encontro ou contra ou uma posição científica favorável aos interesses é, dos seres humanos e não sei se eu estou me expressando bem, né? mas assim, é, se existe algum empecilho é, do ponto de vista religioso... Religioso ou, ou ético também? Você ético, dizer. moral, ético, religioso, sabe? que nós, seres humanos, podemos fazer em relação à manipulação genética para que é, a aleatoriedade dos nossos genes seja, de certa forma, assim, preservada, que seja feita uma certa vontade, não sei. Ah, é, é uma questão assim que eu estava com dúvida, sabe? Não, eu mean, ethics, of course, is a very you know, important uh, aspect, and that's why I said earlier on, you know, we need to have the ethical debate about whether we do that, and that in a lot of countries, what I just talked about, you know, changing the genome of people using CRISPR-Cas or whatever kind of technology will be hard, and I think Germany, in fact, will be the last country on the planet where this is possible, because people hate genetics in Germany, right? Like, genetics is evil, and they don't want to have tomatoes that have genes inside. I like, what? <laughs> Every tomato has genes inside, but they don't want that. You know, we have in the supermarket you can buy food that is gene free. It's like, I mean, honestly, I'm a geneticist. There's nothing that has no genes because there's, you know, DNA is everywhere. But you know, people don't like genes. It's a brick tomato, it's a stone tomato. <laughs> I, I don't know, like made of uh, some sort of chemistry, right? Um, so. The ethical debate needs to be done, and you know how far do we do is up to us, right? We we have that debate, and you will have that debate in your country. We'll have that debate in my country. We will have it as humanity, right? The technology is there now. We will change that. What, of course, we have to be aware of that we have already introduced things, you know, like medicine, 
medicine itself is allowing people to live that would die otherwise quite often, right? So we have already changed what God or whoever, the creator, wanted because we have basically developed medical treatments that allow people to live that would have died otherwise, right? So if there's just, you know, God's will, then we should stop doing medicine, right? Stop taking antibiotics and just let the work, let God do what he needs to do or whoever, right? That's kind of what we don't do. We have started in the 1970s with, you know, in vitro fertilization, right? There is about 40 million people living on the planet today that wouldn't exist, you know, if nature would just, you know, let nature be, but they were created in vitro, right? They were basically eggs and sperm were kind of fused and then stuck back into the mother, right? That's kind of standard procedure. It's not even that people kind of are so concerned about it, but, you know, that's actually a big step because, you know, those people might be natural and infertile, but we make them kind of have children. So we're actually increasing right now the frequency of genes for infer infertility, right? Because we're creating people that are biologically maybe infertile, but we are still giving them the chance to procreate, which is fine because everybody should have children, so we're doing that, right? But, you know, in terms of population genetics or biology, you could say it's a bad thing, but, you know, nobody would say that, so it's, it's fine. It's like with medical treatment, you know, we would also not say those people shouldn't live because they're not fit, you know, we're not living in kind of social Darwinism or something like that. So therefore, you know, we are having those things already, and then you know, maybe coming a bit to the kind of German's critique about genes, I think people are more afraid of this type of, you know, kind of treatment that we just talked about than what it actually would do. I mean, I, I don't really think it is bad to kind of cut out breast cancer genes from families. It's not bad to kind of, you know, do those things. You know, we will not change creation because in a way we're doing that already on a daily basis, you know. Um, so, the, you know, then we should really go back to some sort of natural state and live in the forest or something like that. But, you know, nobody really wants that. I think it's over-romanticized, you know. Um, so, and we might even need it to some degree, you know. But that's something that we could debate, say, for, for, for plants and, and animals. I, I'm very much, you know, also in favor of, you know, using that type of technology on plants to produce more food, to produce, you know, more wood to kind of, you know, use technologies, use the toys and tools we have, you know, in genetics to, you know, play around a bit with, 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 with diversity. And then people are, oh my God, you're playing God. It's like, no, I'm not playing God. You know, what do you currently do? Like, how did you get from a wolf to a chihuahua, right? I mean, how did you get from Teosinte to, like, mace, right? It's like, how do you do that? You know, I mean, that's something you call breeding. That's fine. You know, why is that fine? You know, that you just take mutations that come from sun radiation and rain down on diversity and then you kind of combine the right ones. Or, that's how we did it for 10,000 years, what did we do in the 20th century? We actually take radioactivity and kind of, you know, make it a bit faster. So what are we doing right now for breeding? We're actually taking, you know, you know some sort of, you know, kind of germ cells, exposing them to radioactivity, introducing random mutations all over the genome of those plants or animals, and then, you know, creating new traits. I, this is totally fine. Like, nobody in Germany has a problem with that, or nobody in a lot of places has a problem with breeding and how currently, you know, diversity is created, which is a much more random process than saying, I changed this gene, and I know what that gene is doing, and I change it from an A to a T. But instead, I, you know, have radiation on, you know, to get, get a new flower that has, like, blue instead of, like, red uh, blossoms or something like that, which is, which is a little bit funny. So, yeah, I, I, I think... You know, as a, as a geneticist, you know, I have to defend my, my, my science a bit. I mean, not all crazy and we're kind of, you know, thinking about recreating or playing God or something like that. I think something that, you know, we're doing in a lot of places already. Still said, we, of course, need to be boundaries, we need to be careful, we need to have it controlled, we need to talk about it, we need to have participation, and if people feel it shouldn't be done, like in Germany, it was basically decided you cannot create stem cells anymore in 2002, because there was a discussion and people said, no, we don't do that because embryos were used to create stem cells. We don't do that anymore. Even though those, those embryos were discarded anyway, they were kind of thrown away because they were part of the in vitro fertilization process where you take one that you put into the mother bag and seven you throw away. Well, now they're just thrown away, but you don't use them for science anymore, right? Um, and then, you know, there's, there's other things where, you know, where we're doing a lot of things already, but then, yeah, again, we have the debate, we... We talk about it, and uh, when people decided, like in Germany in this case, we shouldn't do it, or 
currently we don't do genetic manipulation of plants in Germany, in Germany anymore because we're so afraid of genes. So you cannot have, say, potatoes that are genetically manipulated. You cannot grow them in Germany. It's impossible, right? It's like they trample them down the field, right? It's totally fine to do animal research in Germany. <laughs> Mostly, at least, that's kind of crazy in the UK. You cannot kind of work on animals there. It's like you know, every country will be different. Um, but yeah, we'll have that debate. And we cannot have that debate as humanity, I think, because we're not. You know, we can hardly agree on you know, uh, you know politics and many other things. Uh, uh, but uh, yeah, I think it will will happen. But then again, you know, it could happen sooner in some places and later in other places. Sorry, long answer. <laughs> no problem, uh, Eric. Na verdade, não é uma pergunta, é uma opinião que eu gostaria de saber de você. Essa jornada evolutiva né, do nosso genes, passando pela saúde, né, na, na questão de que essa terapia, essa manipulação genética, será capaz de corrigir determinados erros, como, por exemplo, uma alteração em nossos cromossomos, dando como consequência a distrofia muscular, você acredita que isso será capaz de ser corrigido no futuro? Uh, I could say short answer, yes, absolutely, we will do that. Um, because we can, right? We have the tools to do it now. And uh, again, you know, the methods need to be improved a bit and we have to have the ethical debate whether we should do it. Like muscle dystrophy is a nice example, right? It is a genetic disease. It's a gene, right? Like my grandfather had it. You know, fortunately, my father only got the Y chromosome for women, not the X chromosome, where it would be like coded on. So I'm, I'm safe, right? I, I don't have it, right? But he could have had it, you know, theoretically, you know, if he would have been a woman. My grandfather didn't have, you know, uh, uh, females. He only had, you know, two, two male sons, uh, no daughters. Um, so therefore, he didn't kind of pass it on. But, you know, if he could, like, you know, change that now and say, I would have it, and, you know, my, my daughter could then have a chance to have it as well, you know, if I have the tools to not have a daughter that has that horrible disease, horrible disease, right? It's like you kind of decrade through time. It's like one of those things like Parkinson's other disease, which is horrible. There's nothing you can do about it. Hunting disease, nothing you can do about it, right? If we have ways to kind of fix that, I think we have to, right? We have to, right? That's kind of what, you know, it's progress. That's how it grows medical progress, right? We'll do it. And of course, there's a risk to have other things change then as well, like eye color or whatever, kind of, you know, blonde hair or something like that. But I think we should take that risk for kind of saving all those people. There are like millions of people in the world suffering from, from genetic diseases um, that, that we have to change. On the other hand, and that's what some people argue, then we're also reducing a sort of, you know, genetic diversity with this, right? Because sometimes it's clear hunting disease or, you know, muscle dystrophy, like Duchenne, or something like that. It's very clear that it's a certain gene, we know exactly what it is. But not on everything is as clear as that, right? It's a mono, monogenic disease where you know it's the one gene, you kind of revert that then it's fine. Like breast cancer, you know, BRCA1 or BRCA3, you change it back, it's all fine, everything is fixed. Um, there could be also things that are, you know, a bit more on the spectrum, like we talked about, like behavior, autism, schizophrenia, there is certain genes, they kind of have a bit of an effect, then it gets more difficult, I think. And that's a bit more of a question, because there we could also, you know, change it, maybe things that are, you know, just contributing to certain behavior, and then what is a disease, what is not a disease. Like, I like that in, in English you call, you know, the spectrum, you know, autistic diseases. You don't say it's autism or not. It's a spectrum, and that's really what autism is. Autism is not like, you know, there's many different stages, and some people are you know, slightly, and some people are very far on that spectrum. Um, and, and there, you know, from where on in the gradient, again, you will say it's this or it's that, right? Where should we, you know, kind of start there? This is where I think it will be much, much harder. But I think for the monogenic diseases, I think absolutely we have to, we have to fix them because they're horrible, you know, if, if they exist. And if we can fix them, we should fix them. What's currently happening, and this is already possible, right? Um, it's a nice example, say, uh, you know, Ashkenazi, for example, in New York, have started in the 1980s already a program with genetic testing, because they have a lot of monogenic diseases in the Ashkenazi population. So they started to test people for the presence of certain genes. And what they then did is they, <laughs> they still do that today, the families talk about who should marry who, right? It's not always free choice, <coughs> how you choose your partner. 
And uh, there's a whole organization behind that, right? And then, <coughs> like children with 12 years, they usually get kind of the medical checkups, and part of that is a genetic test. And then they kind of know who has what gene. And then they know who, you know, should marry and who should not marry, and then whatever, kind of the mother then calls the clinic and then asks, you know, you know, Michal, should she marry David or not, right? And then it's like, yeah, maybe she shouldn't, or maybe she should, right? And by doing that, it's incredible. They have reduced the number of cases to almost zero in the last 30 years, right? It's incredible how they, how they have managed that. Like, at least the population or kind of, there's not all of the communities that participate, but the people that do participate in that. What they're now doing, and this is now for the last you know, 10 years or so, is they're using pre-implantation diagnostic. So they're basically having, they test the embryos, right? If the disease is present or if it's not present, and if it's present, then boop, and if it's not present, then bloop, right? Um, and that will basically mean that, yeah, over the next, you know, if they kind of continue doing that for the next 100 years, theoretically, it will be completely eradicated. Like, that is basically, they fix that in their population. And that's already happening for 10 years, right? Again, that is okay, right? That's not a problem, but it's a problem if we kind of, you know, instead of killing the embryo, we're just repairing that one gene, right? This is kind of like, you know, maybe better, but I don't know. Don't have, you know, I'm not too invested. So I'm not my science. I'm mean, talking now for like half an hour about something that actually not my science. That's more like, you know, defending genetics or kind of like where, where we're moving in the future. Um, but yeah, I think we will do it. And uh, I think, you know, it will, won't even take too much time. Uh, the truth is that CRISPR-Cas, even though it got the Nobel Prize in 2020, and it's like very much hyped and everybody talks about it, it still creates a lot of artifacts. It's not there yet in terms of technology. So it was crazy that there were those two children that were, those twins that were generated in, in China or that these claims would be generated in 2018 with the technology that wasn't right. I mean, at that time, if it was true, nobody knows actually it was true. If it was true, it would have created, you know, lots of artifacts throughout the genome. Like not change just one gene, but change like dozens or maybe even hundreds of genes in the genome. So hopefully that didn't happen, but we don't know. One more. <laughs> É, só queria que você comentasse que o trabalho que você está fazendo junto com o professor André na USP, no MEI, qual o trabalho que você vai desenvolver aqui no Brasil? Não, sure, I'm very happy to talk about that a bit more, not just about the future of humanity, <laughs> um, more concrete in a way. Um, so, we're doing several projects here, and so we have started to collaborate already almost 10 years ago, I think. Um, to work on uh, some of the uh, human remains that Andre is uh, excavating in sites like Lago do Santo, for example, like in the kind of like more kind of north, north from here, like more central, central Brazil, central eastern Brazil, and that are very old human remains up to 10,000 years old from kind of some of the first people that basically came to South America or kind of settled in the Americas, trying to understand the genetic history, the settlement history of South America as a continent, or the Americas in general, because the Americas itself, as many of you know, have been settled around, you know, I should be careful here in Brazil, because I know there's some archaeologists that believe people were here earlier, but kind of the majority <laughs> opinion of archaeologists and geneticists currently is that around 15,000 years ago, people came from Beringia starting to North America and then South America and settled basically those two continents. Um, and trying to understand this process, we of course, you know, can look at the modern people today, but it's much better to look at the ancient people. That's what we're doing with Andre and, 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 and other archaeologists in, in <coughs> South America, uh, to study the genomes of those people from the past, comparing them to the genomes of people that live today and other people from the past, and trying to reconstruct the settlement history. And we're seeing interesting patterns. We're seeing multiple waves of people coming to South America. There's an initial migration there around four or five thousand years ago. There's a second migration, larger migration of people from North America to South America. Then there's dynamics within the Americas which are quite interesting. You see, for example, in the eastern part of South America, like Brazil, there's more genetic discontinuity. There's populations that kind of move, basically. Whereas in the Andes, for example, like in Peru, in a lot of places, we have almost complete genetic continuity for 10,000 years. So the first people that came there 10,000 years ago, where we have genomes from, there are 
looking like the people that live there today, basically. So it's incredible. It's like I told you that earlier this is an exception. It is an exception. We have that only there, to my knowledge, and nowhere else in the world. Um, so this is something that we're interested in. <coughs> and we want to extend that in the future also to other regions. <coughs> because there is some interesting um, populations like... I'm sorry. <coughs> talking the whole day, so <laughs> um, there is some populations like in, um, in the Amazon, for example, that have some interesting population or like ancestry and affinity to uh, populations outside the Americas, like Papua New Guinea, it's an Australian, it's a <coughs> population we call population Y, it's like a ghost population, the population doesn't exist, but it's a component that some people have, we're trying to understand that. And, um, that's something we find in modern people like Caritiana and Surui, which are Brazilian populations. Um, but um, now we're trying to, to, to look in the past and see if that's something that, that, that also exists in the past. So we're trying to, for example, look then into kind of ancient samples from the Amazon or from other regions and comparing that to uh, modern people and ancient people and uh, trying to understand that process better. It's basically, if you want, we want to give some sort of history to people from prehistory. Right, what we call genetic history, because often the bones themselves or the archaeology doesn't, you know, talk to us as much as maybe genetics do. At least for, you know, where people come from and how they moved. That's something that we can really contribute a lot. How they're related, you know, whether they're always there or whether they're different people there. That's kind of harder for, for archaeologists to ask, and that's where we're collaborating. And we also started um, a, a little partner group. So uh, Andre was actually awarded uh, Max Planck. Um, partner group, so between the Max Planck Society and, and uh, USP, and with this kind of <coughs> um, contribution, plus of course support from USP, they're building up a little ancient DNA lab here now, so they have um, also the ability to do archaeogenetics now also in Brazil, uh, which is also important, <coughs> sorry, to basically um, then have the the people here are also able to, to do this type of science that we are doing in a lot of other places in the world. Once again, thank you so much for a very interesting conversation. Pessoal, é, o livro do, do professor Krause está tá ali fora disponível para quem para quem se interessar. É, ele vai autografar também para quem, quem quiser comprar. Eu recomendo fortemente. É um trabalho fantástico, muito bem escrito, muito gostoso de ler. Então, quem se interessar, é, aproveitem, porque vale a pena. E é isso. Muito obrigado a todos. Boa noite a todos. Até a próxima.